I don't pretend to have a solution or to know what's going to happen. I think it's a risky thing to do anyhow. And if we learn something from uh, the developments around the world in the recent uh, months, we should know that uh, predicting what will happen uh, is not only risky, but also useless. So um, uh, I've been one of the founders of the peace movement here in the late 70s. And um, I've been involved in uh, most of the peace initiatives and negotiation groups that were here in the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, and until I went into the government. And even then, I was part of the Kim David team, and then the Taba team, and then the Geneva uh, group, so I've seen it all. Uh, and the conclusion, or my conclusion, is very simple. Uh, every time a group reconvenes and tries to discuss um, a new perspective on the conflict, they come back to the old, very well-known solutions. I haven't seen a new idea for many, many years. Uh, it's all minor. So if you look uh, at the maps, uh, the changes are small. And I think since the Clinton initiative and then the Geneva initiative, we all know if there will be a solution, what it would look like. 2% here, 2% there. I don't think that's the really significant issue. Uh, and that's not, it's, that's not why we're not having a solution. The only question is a question of uh, political will. Is there a political will on both sides to give up uh, enough in order to create a decent compromise. And it's a compromise. Both sides will not like it. Uh, and both sides will have to give up things that are important for them in order to, co to come up with the solution and then to implement it. And implementation will be a very important and difficult part of any uh, future agreement. Unfortunately, the answer is no. There is no political will. And therefore, we are where we are for the last, I don't know, how many years. It's not that we lack ideas. It's not that we don't know what could be done. It's not that we don't know what the possible borders could, be, um, could look like. It's not that we even don't know how to solve the Jerusalem issue or how to solve the refugee issues. There have been sort of formulas on the table, and they were discussed, and they could be altered a little bit here or a little bit there. The question is, who is ready to pay a political price for that? Um, few Israeli leaders tried. The last one was Ehud Olmert. Um, I think if he would have been in power longer, he may have tried harder. I don't know. That's what he claims. Let's see the book coming out. I mean, the Israelis know there is a big debate about Olmert's book. So let's see what he will claim uh, in the book. He was ready to go ahead, never had enough political power to do it. And on the Palestinian side, although a lot of people would like to see a solution, there is also great weakness, great political weakness. So we never had a moment where both sides were A, willing, B, strong enough, and internationally supported enough in order to move ahead towards a solution. So the question is not whether there is another solution, but could there be a motivating power to move towards a solution? Now, from the Israeli point of view, I would say that there are not many alternatives. Uh, the one state alternative is actually the end of, or of the understanding of the Zionist dream as we understand it. By the way, if I was a Palestinian, uh, I would go for a one state solution. Israel will disappear in a few years. It, nothing will remain. Uh, it will be a binational state, and soon it will be a one national state, and it won't be a Jewish state. Uh, but under the present circumstances, for um, Israelis who would like to retain something of the Zionist dream, the two-state solution is the only solution. And I hear a lot of uh, sort of new ideas coming from the settlers, coming from the right, how they will 
create one state without giving the Palestinians political rights in order to retain the Jewish majority. That's not only inconceivable in moral terms, it's also inconceivable in political terms. And I know how many Americans are in the audience. So you, you're not gonna like what I'm gonna say. <laughs> the one good thing that happened because Trump was elected. How many of you voted Trump? <laughs> okay. No, no. So the one good thing that happened because Trump was elected, I'm almost becoming a Trump fan, is that before he was elected, the right in Israel thought there's no limits to the power they can exert on the Trump administration and they can annex the territories, they can move the embassy to Jerusalem, and they can do everything they want. As soon as Trump came here and sent here the most right-wing ambassador ever, the right understood their limits. And if it's Trump or if it's Obama, it doesn't really make a difference. There's a limit of what Americans can do, even under a president like Trump. So now the game is very clear. Nobody in America, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, and you, usually, by the way, that's what people used to say in Israel, no matter who sits in the White House, they'll have the same position towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So it doesn't matter who sits in the White House. Uh, we're not going to have support for a one-state solution, certainly not without giving the Palestinians uh, the right to vote. So that option is gone. And we're back to the old option. Uh, the, the other thing that we've learned is that nobody's going to put too much pre pressure on Israel. The, the, the left used to hope that one day somebody would come in the White House or somewhere, the Pope, will say, come on, guys, you have to do it. We're not interesting. We're not enough of a problem to create uh, the motivation for people to intervene in the Middle East. By the way, this is one terrible thing, that the, the one of the terrible things that Islamic terrorism did to this region. Because now it's clear that the Islamic terrorism is not about the Israeli-Palestinian issue. It's not going to evaporate even if this problem is solved. So the motivation, the international motivation to solve the Palestinian problem is zero. And we're left on our own. So we're stuck here, very nice people, we know each other for many years. And, you know, we're the good doers, so we're ready to um, bring up all sorts of new ideas. We don't have the political power to move the political scene here or in Palestine, I think. That's, uh, I'm leaving it to, to Sari to say whether he thinks there is a strong political will and power in the Palestinian side. And unfortunately, um, I don't see us moving anywhere uh, in the next uh, few years. The only uh, thing that could move both sides to a solution, unfortunately, if the things get worse, especially on the Israeli side. The Israeli side lives a relatively pleasant, calm life. Nobody is really interested in the conflict. Very few, pe less and less people are interested in the conflict. Um, even in the last election, uh, the one, I think, most uh, distinguished fact about the election was the, deb the debate about the peace agreement was not there. The word peace wasn't mentioned at all. Occupation. Or occupation, no, occupation is out. So it's not about ideas, it's about politics, it's about power, it's about pressure. And unfortunately, uh, that I don't know how to um, solve. I don't know if anyone knows how to solve that. Um, I said earlier that, you know, I, I sort of given up. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I've been in this business for many years, and once a year I come to a meeting like this because I feel really blameworthy that I'm not doing something about it. And then I remind myself that I don't know what to do. So here is my uh, confession. I think I know what the solution should be. I think we all know what the solution should be. Uh, I don't know how to get there. And um, in order to do that, we need to recruit people we don't know how to recruit, and we need to speak to uh, audiences we don't really uh, approach. And we're, we're unfortunately staying within our own po political circle. We are talking to each other, and this is why we're actually not being extremely influential. So I'm sure you're not more optimistic now than you were before, but um, <laughs> that's life.